Uh, a few words uh, about me. Um, I have worked on this region since I joined the Foreign Office in 1991. Uh, I graduated uh, as a history graduate uh, from Cambridge University. All the same, I'm glad to be in Oxford today. Um, and I went straight to uh, the Foreign Office. I really wanted to go to Moscow. It was 1991, everybody wanted to go to Moscow. Uh, the queue was so long, I didn't quite reach the front of it, and I was advised to go and learn Arabic instead. <laughs> I'm glad to say I refused that invitation and was determined uh, to work on Central and Eastern Europe. And I went to Vienna, uh, and I worked uh, at the delegation to the OSCE in Vienna in my first posting. But then I had the opportunity to learn Russian and to go to Moscow uh, for my first posting in 1999. And at that time, I was responsible for our program of technical assistance uh, to the Russian Federation. And an important part of that program was on media development. Uh, we had a program that we ran through the BBC, and it had two main projects that we were supporting then. One was a journalist school in Yekaterinburg, BBC school, uh, which provided training in different um, uh, journalistic and media techniques. And the other one was called the um, FNR, uh, Fond Nezavismava Radio the Foundation for Independent Radio, uh, which is still, I think, based in Moscow, and was really looking at the, at the sector of radio. Uh, and based on some of these strong traditions of public sector <coughs> broadcasting that exist here in the UK, was uh, looking to encourage uh, the development of uh, independent radio uh, in the Russian Federation. It ran a famous soap opera called Dom Siam, which I think Tony Blair appeared in at one point. So those were some of the things I was doing in 1999. I went on from there to Ukraine, and I was our deputy ambassador in Ukraine from 2003 until 2008. Uh, I've served as our ambassador to Romania. Um, and most recently, I was our, our deputy ambassador in Russia, um, from uh, 2014 to 2017. Um, I should add that I've traveled all over the region and most especially to Kyrgyzstan, which has been the venue for family holidays for most of the last 20 years. So I've been a very frequent visitor uh, to Lake Isikul and around the Tian Shan Mountains and enjoyed Central Asia. My responsibility in the Foreign Office is as the Director for Eastern Europe and Central Asia. That means I'm responsible for the UK government's relationships uh, with countries, I think, of the countries that are represented here. I'm responsible for the relationship with Armenia, uh, the relationship with Russia, uh, the relationship with Ukraine, and the relationship with Kyrgyzstan. I'm not responsible for our relations with Estonia and with Poland because they fall under the Europe directorate. But obviously, we have a very strong partnership with both Estonia and Poland. And I work closely with colleagues in Tallinn and in Warsaw on issues related to Eastern Europe and Central Asia. I don't want to speak for too long because you have the opportunity to ask me about any aspect of British policy towards those countries. And so I do want to leave time for your questions. But I just wanted to give some personal reflections on the media scene in the region that I cover at the moment. Um, and to say a little bit about the British government's policy on that particular issue, on free media in the countries of Eastern Europe and Central Asia. 
John has already described the difficult backdrop for civil society across much of the region, uh, and specifically in Russia. But I have to say that personally, I feel quite optimistic at the moment about the current developments in media and also some of the developments in politics that we see across the region. We have to remind ourselves that today, in 2020, we have a former journalist who is the Prime Minister of Armenia. Um, we also have to remind ourselves that we have a political satirist as the President of Ukraine. And I think we also have to recognize that, as I see it, there is an extraordinary awakening of high quality investigative journalism that I see in Russia and in Ukraine and in the Baltic states and in the Caucasus and also in Central Asia. There is a new cohort of courageous and professional journalists who understand the importance of their profession and are using extraordinary opportunities that exist now to practice that profession in a radically changing media environment. The radical change is, of course, coming from the internet and the ways in which that is utterly transforming the media environment to the extent that the majority of younger people in Russia today get their news, of course, online from the internet rather than from uh, television. And that's a phenomenon which is not confined to Russia. It's present here in the United Kingdom as well. Um, I think somebody was commenting recently that probably the least used screen in the house these days is the television screen. I don't know about what happens in your home, but it's certainly true of mine that there are multiple screens competing for broadband. I have three daughters, teenage daughters, competing for broadband. And the television is now often the last one to go to. And that is creating uh, all sorts of both risks and opportunities. Uh, opportunities, first of all, because um, across the region of Eastern Europe and Central Asia, there is relative freedom of the internet. And the ability to surf the web, to travel through virtual space, to explore ideas, to access information, is quite extraordinary. I think somebody was commenting recently, can you imagine when the school started nearly 30 years ago now, that in the future, everybody would be carrying one of these in their pocket, the key, a supercomputer with the key to all of the world's knowledge and use it to look at pictures of cats. <laughs> but many people are using their possibilities to access information beyond their space and to look at all kinds of information and to be free and creative in accessing that. And that is a fantastic opportunity for those in the media profession to be able to withstand those who would try and limit information and limit discussion and instead ruthlessly root for information. And the possibilities of investigative journalism have been demonstrated over the last year across this region. And then to distribute it and to discuss it openly across the internet. 
The result of that is that state-dominated information is declining rapidly, particularly among the younger generation. And online media is expanding. So those are great opportunities. But of course, there are risks as well. And we're very conscious that this method <laughs> can also be used for harm. It can be controlled too. It can help to only reinforce people's prejudices and opinions rather than opening them up for discussion. It can be a tool that has been abused by trolling, by disinformation, by inauthentic activity. And I think rather belatedly, those major platforms that are responsible for this environment are waking up to the fact that their platforms are being abused to spread disinformation and that they need to respond to that. In the Foreign Office, we are determined to ensure that we give an adequate response to both those risks and opportunities. And one of the things I'm responsible for is a major program that we run in many different countries, which has two sides, countering disinformation and media <coughs> development. There are two sides to this coin. So on the one hand, it's very important that we are effective in countering disinformation. And there are many organizations that are dedicated to exposing campaigns of disinformation when they can be found on the internet and elsewhere. And so one of the things that we do is we support those organizations that are dedicated to that activity. But at the same time, in order to have a society <coughs> that is truly resilient against disinformation, you need to have media development. You need to have strong and effective independent media. And so the other part of our approach is around media development. It's ensuring that there is a plurality of media, including in the Russian language. Uh, it's ensuring that there is um, resilience in society and understanding of how to use uh, social media for information, and how to be aware of the ways in which it may be abused and you are being served up not with good information but with disinformation. And it's encouraging those many uh, new online media actors, media aggregators, um, journals, uh, investigative journalism, uh, who have proved over the last year in particular uh, that they are the new cohort of professional journalism that we see developing across the region. So through our programs, uh, we support those activities. And also through our policies, we continue to really emphasize the importance of free media. I like the fact that this seminar is dedicated to freedom of speech, media, and society, because it's important to put free media in that wider context for free society and freedom of speech. In that way, it is, free media is a fundamental pillar of a free society. Last year, the Foreign Office co-hosted with Canada a global conference on freedom of media. Our Foreign Secretary, Jeremy Hunt, at the time, did that because he felt it was really important to respond to the threats that free media was facing around the world. Journalists who have, um, in all too many cases, paid with their lives for their profession. 
And he wanted the international community to come together to recognize and uphold the universal values on which free media is based. I really want to emphasize this point. These are not British values, although we hold them very dear. These are universal values, which are set out in the United Nations Charter and also set out clearly in the commitments in the Council of Europe and also in the Organization for Security and Cooperation in Europe, the OSCE, where I began my career, to which all the countries represented in this room have subscribed and are committed to upholding. And those values need to be defended and needed to be acted upon by journalists in their profession, as well as by diplomats in international conferences. And the point, I want to end on this point, the point that Jeremy Hunt really underlined at that conference is that a free media is not just essential to protect against the abuse of power. We often think about free media as being the, the fifth estate, the part of the constitution that holds power accountable. And that's terribly important. That is part of the constitutional role, whether it's written down or not. It's part of the constitutional role of a free media to protect against the abuse of power and to hold those in power accountable. But it's more than that. It's also about how you unleash the potential of your own societies. Because free media is about the free flow of ideas. And today, that is absolutely critical to the success and indeed the prosperity of any society. In our own country, in the United Kingdom, we've made the move from heavy industry to light industry to creative industry. And today, creative industry is probably the most dynamic <coughs> and the most important part of most major developed economies. It's that ability to be creative, to discuss, to debate, to find out ideas, to be able to circulate information that's really essential uh, to be a successful economy today. And indeed now, thanks to the internet, information circulates so fast that the ability to manage that process, to capture that information, to hold information, to use it, to have ideas, and to develop them and to discuss them and to debate them, that ability is really essential for the development of society as well as the economy. And that's the responsibility of free media. That's why a free media stands at the center of free speech and of a free society. And it's why creating and establishing and developing a free media is what all societies should do if they want to prosper in this next decade.